Awol Shalom Rastafari Shabbat Shalom Senbet Salam Sabbatical greetings of peace in the name of the King of Kings and His Christ Joshua Jesus Christos Ha Moshi Ha Moshiach the Messiah our Black Lord and Savior Jesus Christ this is the twenty <coughs> this is the twentieth Sabbath in our cycle of Torah portion readings and feedings and I am Wendem Yadon, otherwise known as Ras Yadinos Tefari or Ras Iodonis. Now this is um uh Teve. First of all let's go to um, our Sabbath house readings. Hopefully you've downloaded this from www.lojsociety.org. It's a free download. Um, so you can follow along with the readings and the feedings and the teachings and can learn the original way of keeping, remembering and keeping the Sabbath um, set apart and holy as well as strengthening, you know, gaining your spiritual strength in the Word and in the knowledge of the Son of God, the Bain Ha Elohim, Joshua or Yeshua Ha Moshia. So now what we have in front of us right here is a Sabbath house reading. And let's just get this right here. We're looking for one of the graphics here. This came up. And we'll find this particular, let's just find this right here, and then we'll move forward, of the menorah. And there's a particular um, menorah arrangement. Here we go, right here. A menorah arrangement, which is likened to the star. Um, a particular unique um, arrangement, and it kind of proves um, the Hebraic use of what's called the six-pointed star, as you can see right here, the one probable arrangement. The error rate here is that it says uh, candlestick, and that's um, what they call anachronistic, anachronistic. That's like against the chronology, against the time, because there was no such, um, there was no such, uh, uh, usage, you know, of of candles, especially not the candles that people began to use, which were of pork and pork fat and other things. Um, uh, the court, yeah, pork fat and other things. All right. Um, give I and I a moment because we got um we got to put the charger in so we can continue with this teaching. So that's a possible, a, a probable actually arrangement, not just possible. Let's first of all start from the start from the the top of this teaching, right? And we're gonna go to our Sabbath house reading and feedings, um, and we hope to make more available. We have it for order right now, but we hope to try to make these teachings more disseminable to where ones can have the books. Books are, you know, books are books are very special, you know, like being able to. You know, you could read things on the internet, but if you're able to, um, all right, if you're able to, like, look at the book, you know, the books are very, very special, and we and we know the history of books and printing and how, you know, so many people gave their lives so that the Bible and the word of the word of Jah could be disseminated, you know, throughout throughout almost all time, but especially over the last 2,000 years, perhaps you might understand the importance. In fact, they say if you want to hide something from some people, you just basically put it in the book. If you put it in the book, they'll never get to know it, you understand. So that's a, you know, be wise as serpents, harmless as doves, pick sense out of nonsense. Bamarinya in them hark, and here we have, is uh is a zacho is a zacho 
in the Hebrew it's it's uh te a we te a we or in the more Yiddish Ashkenazi um um pronunciation te a ve te a ve te a ve te a ve but we say te a we and that basically means you command in other words or Bamarinya is a Zacho command them. So let's bring up the Yota the Yota software if we can. Let's uh bring up the Yota software. Okay, we can close you close that up right there so we can make a little more space for this. And um here's the verse. First of all, let's go over this te te awe. Let's show you this in the Hebrew. In another demonstration right here um, in the Hebrew. Now, this is interesting. Watch how this changes. This is the cardo, cardo font of the Hebrew, right? See how that goes right there? Interesting, right? Like a like a sun, you know, almost looks like, it almost looks like the, the aten, the te, and then it changed to the Hebrew te. So that's, um, that would be it in the Hebrew. Right there, right? T a we he t a we t a we. Um, they say ve vav, but really it's wow, wow. And let's point to the Hebrew right there. This is a W, but the Ashkenazis pronounce it as a as a V. You know that difference right there as a V. Um, we've touched on that before and. Hopefully we'll touch on that again. But let's move forward, all right? So there's a verse that begins off. Um, it means you command, you command, you male command. And it's the second word and the first distinctive word in the portion or the parsha, Bamarinya and Amharic, we say kufal. That means the a part or a portion. And it's a 20th weekly Torah portion in the annual Hebraic and, and uh, Judaic cycle of Orit uh, Minbab, Nebab, Orit, the Ethiopic for Torah, Torah, Minbab, Nebab, reading. And it's the eighth in the book of Exodus, or the Orit Ze Se'at, the Orit of coming out, of the coming out. Now it constitutes Exodus chapter 27, verse 20, to Exodus chapter 30, verse 10. Now, we as Hebrews and as black Jews in the diaspora, in this north country, we read it. In the western hemisphere, we read it in the 20th uh, Senvet or Sabbath or Shabbat after the Simchat Torah or the Sisahar Zeorit, which is the joy of the or read the joy of Jah's law, generally in February or March. Now, the date is, this is going into the, the Saturday. Evening has passed and morning is coming. And, you know, the Tuat is coming in. And the date is, today's date is what? Today is the uh, 3rd. This is the 3rd of March, just to date this. Now, the first verse is the 21st right here, the 21st right here. Um, and the chapter is the 27th chapter, right? And the Bamarinya, let's start out with the Amharic, Besama'ab, where well women says Kedus, Ahadu, Amlat, Orit, Ze, Se'at, Haya, Sabat, Kuter, Haya, antem mebaratun hulgize ya berut zen le mebrata te wekto yete telle teru ye waira zait india metule ye israelin alijocha izezacho izezacho that's a te awe. Now, the King James Version right here, Exodus 27, verse 20 says, And thou shalt command the children of Israel 
that they bring the pure olive, pure oil, olive, pure oil, olive beaten for the light to lamb, to cause the lamp to burn always, to cause the lamp to burn always. Now, we can go to the individual words here, but let's just bring this part up, um, the command part, and thou command. So you can um, get the root of uh, te awe or te ave, te awe, and it's a uh, a va or tau vav, but really tau wow, tauwe, tauwe, tauwe is a primitive root intensively to constitute, enjoin something to a point for, to a point for or to, to bid somebody to do something or to forbid someone, to bid or to forbid, to give a charge, give a, give in, send with command, commander, commandment, send a messenger, put and here's the key right here. You see that? Set in order. To set in order. So that command word, izazacho, is very, very important. The command is a tizaz, a tizaz. So when we speak about the ten words or the commandment, falsely called the ten commandments, but it's the ten words, one commandment. And here... Musa is being told that he is to command that the children of Israel, the children of Israel, that they bring the, bring him pure oil, or some say clear oil, pure oil, olive, beaten, for the what? For the mebrat, for the light, to cause the lamp to burn always. Now, there's some interesting um, rabbinic and non-rabbinic notes on that that we have in our Shemot, the Hebrew book of Exodus, the Torah portion, the companion to our our studies, the volume two for the book of Exodus um, that's based on the Wikipedia, the free encyclopedia um, compilation of the Torah portion, the Parasha, the Parashiot, uh, was a Terefe. Now, let's get into this portion right here, because this portion right here, now, it concerns the high priest and the instructions that were given to the high priest. Now, we know that these are types. You know, we, we have to understand that these are types. And so what we want to do right here is set in order a couple of, um, a couple of uh, word pictures um, the best that we could find available um, that will help us to teach and explain the lesson. You understand? With, when you can really see it and understand it, and as you read it, you can say, okay, that's, what it's, that's, a, that's a visualization. You understand? That's a word picture. They say a, a picture is like a thousand words. You understand? Especially if it's a right and appropriate picture. Now, of course... We try to find, you know, um, you know, more appropriate images. You understand, but some of these images will basically do. We, we, we should avoid the hate that hate produced. You know what I'm saying? Um, in the love of the King of Kings and His Christ, but be wise as serpents, harmless as doves. So we're going to use some of these images. This particular picture here of of the high priest right here. In, in what is thought to believe, you know, to be the, the priestly garments, and we're going to discuss that over here. It has more detail of the high priest, the kahin um, ha-gadol in the Hebrew, or the leek kahinat. And this is also a picture of a high priest with, a, with a, uh, one of the priests with a censer, and he has the breastplate, he has the afut on, he has those eight, those eight um, articles of garment, and here he's at the altar of incense, right? Of incense, or itan. Bamarinya, we say itan. 
the altar of Aishans is, let's say, in the Rastafari way, the altar of Aishans right here, which is before the veil. Now, behind this veil now, and see, even the colors are significant. You, you see how, how Satan's kingdoms have tried to appropriate these colors. So we see these colors like the, the blue and the red, and automatically, or even the blue and the white, and automatically, um, lost sheep will think that, oh, the, these are American, European, or, or belong to other people, but these are actually Afro Shemitic col colors that were used in even ancient times, and we can trace these things even to ancient Egypt, the Yahwist. There were Yahwists in ancient Egypt that knew Joseph and were of the same. They were Egyptians as citizens, but they were spiritual kinsmen in their faith in Yahweh, in the true God, Yovazan, that became the God of Israel when he chose that people out of Egypt. Now, there's a couple of elements that's going to be discussed in this particular parasha, in this particular um, portion. And... One of the first is the high priest. You, you understand, is the high priest. And um, let's look at some of these illustrations here. And we're going to pull up this particular illustration right here and enlarge and it to uh, a, full, a fuller size so we can actually examine, examine some of the elements, some of these elements that are spoken of in this particular in this particular portion here all right so this is the golden garments you understand and there's eight you know there's eight um garments that make up the full garment of the kohen um ha godol you understand um according to shemo chapter 28 um and and four uh, to forty, I think forty-two, um, and when we're still in, we're still in chapter, we're still in chapter uh, twenty-seven, which is speaking of the oil for the menorah uh, in the Hebrew, and we say mebrat, the mebrat bamarinya. So let's address that. Give me a moment. Let me get my Schofield because Schofield sometimes has important notes now. You should be familiar with the song. You should be familiar with the song that says, the song that says, um, you know, the Lord is my light and my salvation. And now these are some symbols. You understand? These are symbols and, and the Schofield, the notes in the Schofield um, do a whole lot of justice if you would even spend the time to study these these notes within the within the um, the Schofield Study Bible. Because now we're we're still dealing with the tabernacle. We touched briefly on the tabernacle in last week's parsha and in previous um, in previous portions Torah portions from the previous cycle. We have gone into a little more detail here and there. There's a lot, there's, there's much that's in here. There's a lot of moving parts, you know, and, and things that connect. And I'm trying to, I'm trying to, to preach as well as mainly here teach some of the important elements and what to look out for in the fullness of the testimony of Christ. But you need to understand the, the, the parable of the tabernacle, you understand the significance of the tabernacle. But let's bring up this um, cross section, and truly it's a cross section of the tabernacle, right? Let's enlarge in this right here. Here we have the tabernacle, right? And we have the brazen altar. You enter in from the east. Remember before we showed the tribes and how it forms a cross? It almost looks like an Ethiopian, you know, what they call a Coptic cross when you compare the tabernacle and the tribes encamped at those four, at the four points. You understand at the, at the um, east, west, um, 
the north and the south or the south and the north, as it were. So here we have the brazen altar. You can see we have the brazen altar and uh, things that the brazen altar has already been addressed briefly before, but we'll touch on it again. Now, we superimpose this red cross, you understand, to highlight something very important. We were going to put, you know, uh, uh, evidently displayed crucifixion of our black Lord and Savior here, but just to, to understand the the connection with the cross and the tabernacle, as we showed it before with the tribes encamped at the different points, you can see it here as well, too. If you would imagine that that the Savior on the cross, his head would be up here where the Holy of Holies is, the Zeras, will be up here, the Ark of the Covenant. Remember, on the Torah, there's a crown. You understand? Actually, there's, actually, there's three crowns. Uh, um... But there's, uh, there's, there's, there's a crowning work. So, the, so because of that, it's at the head position. You understand? So we enter in from the east, but it's facing. Notice the direction that the, that the tabernacle is facing, or the Mechdes is facing. So we have the mercy seat here. We have the Ark of the Covenant. This line here would be the veil. Remember in the previous picture, um, let's move this. Let's move this down for a moment. In this picture here, you can see there's the veil. So you see this veil here. And you see what this is? That is the the altar of Aishans or incense. It, uh, and here we have the altar of incense. Right? This is the tabernacle, the square of the tabernacle. Right? This is the tabernacle. And this is the courtyard of the sanctuary. So all of this is the Mechdes, right? And this is the Mishkan. You understand? The Mishkan, right? Or one can say the birthing place. You understand? Both symbolically a womb and a tomb in, in, its, in its highest metaphorical and metaphysical sense. But let's first just deal with the basics. So we have this square here. And that square there, right, would be the altar of the Aishans, right, that the priest ministers to. Now, there's some laws that are connected in this parasha. And in our Shimo book, um, we're able to, you know, put a lot of that detail in that we might not be able to put all in in this particular um in this particular vid or might not even in the particular series and go into some of the details, but hopefully we can inspire those who are willing to make their wills obedient to good influences, to, to study more, to learn more, to grow more, and in the King of Kings and his Christ to, to be more and to accomplish more for the kingdom. Now, um, of the commandments that are found, right, in this particular portion, this 20th portion, according to Maimonides and the Sefer Ha um, uh, Chinook, uh, there are four positive and three negative um, uh, tizaz or tizazah commandments in the kufu, in the portion. Firstly, is to light the menorah every day, to light the light every day. It's like almost like when we say now, when you understand that these are symbols, but the symbols now have a spiritual and a, and a, and a metaphysical, for lack of a better word, application in Yeshua, in the Moshiach, in, in Christ. So we say the Lord is my light and my salvation, but then the light is also the word because word is a fire. Remember, Jeremiah says that the word is a fire. So we, we are to light the menorah every day. So now when you look in the tabernacle, you see the golden lampstand, right? You see the menorah is right here, the golden lampstand, right? And last, uh, the past uh, summit or week, we touched on, we was able to touch on the table of sh shoe bread, Briefly, the table of shoe bread with its 12 loaves. Now, Josephus rightly linked that with the, the astral theology or the heavenly, the 12 
in the heavens the signs, uh, Genesis 1 and 14, John says there for signs and seasons, days and years. He didn't say we're to worship the hosts of heaven, but we're to recognize these hosts of heavens for signs and seasons and days and years. It's like looking at a clock. You don't worship the clock. You know, say, oh, mighty clock, go back some hours, go forward some hours, tell me how my day is going to be. No, it tells you what time it is. You see, so this is now the outer court, you understand, because in the other, in the other illustration, we show you the, the five, the, you know, the five poles that were there, you understand, in the, in the gateway, we touched on that in the previous portion, but now you're in the outer court section. This is like a top, a top down from heaven, heaven view, right? Then you have the laver, you understand, the laver or the wash basin, so each of these each of these elements, the furniture, and each of these has a symbolic spiritual application in Christ. So when Christ said that even if you tear down this, um, the, this temple, I will build it in, in, in three days. I'll, you know, I'll raise it up, actually raise it up in three days. And they thought he was talking about um, Herod's temple, which people called Solomon's temple because Herod, who was an Edomite, you know, um, almost sort of like Prince in the sense is like an Edomite in that sense, the, the entertainer, and there's others that are like that. I think Houston's father, you understand, know, has some, seems like he has some Edomite or, or, or Canaanite blood mixed there. You understand? So we have been fellowshipping even with our enemies, and many of them are black too. You, you see, so we don't judge by the color, but we judge by the spirit. You understand? That's why Christ said, don't judge by appearance, but judge by righteousness. And many can't because they don't know what righteousness is. So learn righteousness, study Torah, study the scripture, you know, pray, meditate, fellowship with other brothers and sisters, build until now we have the laver here. So you see the lava here, that's the wash basin. Now, all of these elements are highly symbolic. So what, what Yahweh did in the Old Testament time is bring the people from, from pre-K, like Egypt, from pre-K, uh, K through 12, you understand, um, to like college and higher school level, you know, through our experiences. So when Christ says, if you tear down this, this um, temple, you destroy this temple, he would re rebuild it. The Bible tells us that he was speaking of his body. You know what I'm saying? So now that makes us now look at the tabernacle differently. You know what I'm saying? If he was comparing, because even the stone temple that was built by Solomon, this is, this is the movable tent of Moses' time. It, 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 it went that way even past up to David's time. You know what I'm saying? As in, when it was in Shiloh in, in Samuel's time. You know what I'm So the structure, the outline is basically one and the same. Now, the first thing that you meet once you pass the Lion of Judah. Once you pass, because the Lion of Judah is at the gateway. That's where the Lion of Judah is. So even when we look at some of the um, symbolism, the Ethiopic and Imperial symbolism, we can see um, that it's based on, on, on the spiritual template of, of Torah, of the kingdom, of God, in spirit and in truth. The first thing that you will meet once you enter in the gate is the brazen altar. You see, and the brazen altar is where one's brought forward those sacrifices, you know, those animal sacrifices to cover or to atone for not being able to live up to the ten words, not being able to live up to the commandment. And that was as a grace, and we've briefly discussed that, um, that previously as well. So now, what Ha Elohim instructed the Beta Israel, the children of Israel, to do was to bring Moses clear or pure olive oil so that Haron or Aaron and his descendants, as the high priest, that's who Aaron and his descendants were, 
Aaron and his descendants were those um, high priests. You see what I'm saying? They didn't have an a, a, a inheritance in Israel, but they were to serve in the priestical function. So what you see right here is an illustration of the priestly garments. You understand? Of the priestly garments. Let's see, where's the other picture that we had? Of the priestly garments right here. So we have illustrations right here of, here we go, of the priestly garments. And we're going to go through um, some of the details, spend, pay a little bit of attention to that. But let's first deal with the, the what is meant by clear or pure olive oil. What is meant by clear or pure olive oil? So let's go to some of the notes right here to uh, chapter 27, the classic. This is what they call a classic rabbinic um, interpretation or targum, or they will say targum. Exodus chapter 27, the Mishnah, which is actually the first part, uh, if I'm correct, is the first part of the Talmudic or of the teaching. Talmud mean teaching. In Amharic, we say Timharit. So the Mishnah, it posited that one could have inferred that meal offerings, the meal offerings, right, would, and the meal offerings coming out of Egypt would be the Hetep or the Hotep. I'm going to see people say Hetepu, the, 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 the non blood offerings, like the Mebba, in other words, that meal offerings would require the purest olive oil. For if the menorah, for if the menorah whose oil was not eaten required pure olive oil, how much more sh so should meal offerings whose oil was eaten? But Exodus 27 and 20 states, pure olive oil beaten for the light but not pure olive oil beaten for meal offering. So what it's showing in this um, classic rabbinic uh, uh, Turgun, it is showing how to reason. You understand how to reason? Because one could say, well, if it's pure for, for, for the menorah, and let's bring up the menorah, you understand? If it's pure for the menorah, then why isn't it, you know, then why isn't it, so for the meal offering, this should be the same because pay attention to the word. You understand? Um, the, the, the word directs man. Man does not direct the word because the word in the beginning was the word, the word was God, and the word was God. How, how dare we seek to direct God, but the word, it directs us. So pure olive oil beaten for meal offerings to make clear that such purity was required only for the menorah, the mebrat, and not for the meal offerings. Now, the Mishnah taught that there were three harvests of olives. Unfortunately, we don't have a, a picture of any olives. You know, the olive tree is something special. Learn about it. I mean, these things are interesting, you know, how they try to just limit us to these walls, you know, you know, to the ghetto, limit us to just nigger shit, you know.